Hello everyone, this is the CircuitPython Weekly for July 15th, 2024. It's the time of week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Jepler, and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython, which is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so when you uh, purchase hardware from Adafruit.com, you are supporting CircuitPython. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. Join us anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We've got a worldwide community with activity all the time on a lot of topics. But uh, if you're interested in joining us for this meeting live, we hold the meeting in the CircuitPython Dev channel and the CircuitPython voice channel almost every Monday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it coincides with a U.S. holiday. In the notes document, there is a link to the calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send a couple of notifications a week about meetings via Discord. To receive these notifications, or to be able to speak in the meeting, ask us to add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. I just mentioned the notes document that accompanies the meeting and recording. You contribute to this uh, document before the meeting, um, and then we attach it or link to it from the notes of the way that you're watching the show, such as on YouTube. And in that version, it will have timestamps so that you can jump ahead to the part that interests you the most. If you want to leave notes for us but can't make the meeting, you're free to do that. Uh, just put a little note that you're missing the meeting, that uh, you don't have a mic, or so forth, and we'll read them aloud. So this meeting has five parts. Next up is community news, a, a little glimpse into the Every Monday Circuit Python and Python on Hardware newsletter created by our own Anne Barella. We follow that up with the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. We grab a bunch of statistics, mostly from GitHub, and uh, review them and see how we're doing. It is kind of trying to look at things objectively. All right, third part is the first participatory section, and that is Hug Reports, an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing and a way to take time to recognize the awesome folks in our community um, on Discord, on Adafruit, on GitHub, on the socials, and beyond. The fourth part, and in many ways the meat of the meeting, is the status updates, your opportunity to talk about what you've been up to in the week since we last got together and what you hope to accomplish over the next week or so. And we round out the meeting with In the Weeds. If there's anything that needs more long-term discussion, uh, this is when we talk about it. So if you have uh, hug reports, status updates, or items for In the Weeds, please add those to the notes document, and I will go through the content in there as we go. And with that, it is time for me to read about community news. The top headline is that uh, over the weekend, Dan made a release of CircuitPython version 9.1.0. Uh, it is now the latest stable release, and it has a number of added features. And you can check out the full release notes, which also cover some incompatibilities. Another item that was intriguing to me, although I haven't tried it yet, uh, new, new Viper IDE features added. Viper IDE is a third-party development environment for MicroPython and CircuitPython, and it runs entirely within your browser thanks to the power of WebAssembly. And then the final item I picked is from the Adafruit Playground, where community members can contribute their own small projects without the difficulty of setting up a blog and image hosting and all those things. And this one is entitled CamTest Pi Cowbell Camera Breakout Demo. I'll be checking that one out in more detail later today. And that is the end of what I picked as the top items from the newsletter, but there is much more. As, um, as you know, if you, if you read the newsletter lately, it is chunky. It's got a lot of stuff in there. Something will be relevant to you. Uh, this newsletter is emailed every Monday, and it is run by the community. The complete archives are at adafruitdaily.com slash category slash circuitpython. It highlights the latest Python and hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. So, first, uh, first thing is you can head to adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. Your email address that you enter there is only used to send you this email. It's not tied to your Adafruit account. It's not used to send you other unwanted stuff, and you can unsubscribe whenever you want. Next up, if you did a cool project, if you spotted a cool project on Mastodon or other social media that you think deserves wider promotion, uh, you can 
uh, offer it to us for inclusion in the newsletter. And there are a couple of ways to do that. First up, if you live your life on GitHub like I do, you can edit next week's draft directly on GitHub and submit a pull request, write, uh, write it all in Markdown. Another option is to email cpnews at adafruit.com. This is a real reliable option that will uh, fall into the mailbox of Anne. So send her a link, maybe a photograph. You can also tag a post with CircuitPython on Mastodon, Blue Sky, or X. And we kind of monitor that to the best of our ability. But uh, those first two options are really the go-tos. And that wraps it up for the newsletter. Um, and uh, there's a question about where the CP News email address is. I probably misspoke. It's cpnews at adafruit.com. Oh, anyway. So moving on, uh, the next section is entitled The State of CircuitPython, the Libraries, and Blinka. And uh, we gather statistics uh, on a, a daily or weekly basis and uh, try to cover approximately seven days of statistics for most of these things. And we divide it up um, according to the core, the libraries, and Blinka. But uh, first up, our overall GitHub statistics saw 18 pull requests merged from 11 authors. And I want to specifically thank 708 Yamaguchi uh, and Dark Mechanium, oh, and uh, DK100, whose names I don't recognize. So thank you for your uh, infrequent or first contribution. It's lovely to see people who find a way to improve the CircuitPython experience for everyone. Um, and next up, um, Scott, if you are able to pick up your microphone and tell us about the core. Totally. Thank you, Jeff. OK, so numbers for the core. This is the C core of CircuitPython. Um, we had 11 pull requests merged from seven different authors. Uh, and a couple of the new ones that Jeff already said. Uh, so thanks to them. We had four reviewers. Uh, Bill ADAT is getting more frequently as a reviewer, so thanks to them. Um, and we have 18 open pull requests, so we're, we're down a ways, which is great. Um, we're well under our 25 goal, which is the single page listing. Uh, we had uh, issues-wise, we had eight closed issues by five people and five open by five people, so uh, maybe double digits in terms of number of folks involved, and we're net down three, which is great. Uh, we have 700 total open issues, um, so we do creep up a bit. Um, we have nine active milestones. Um, the formerly stable versions, 8.2x and 9.0x, have zero uh, open issues. 9.1x, which 9.0 was released last week, has one open issue. Um, and this says there's three issues, not a send a milestone, but I think Dan clarified that they've been triaged already. Uh, so that's where we're at for the core. All right, thank you. It's always good to see um, those issues get triaged, and I think we depend on Dan for that a lot. Um, I know I seldom get to it. Um, and it may be time to talk in the weeds about when we retire the 8.2 version. But anyway, up next is the libraries, and I checked with Tim earlier, and um, so we're ready when you are. All right, thanks, Jeff. Uh, this section covers the Adafruit libraries, uh, all of which can be found listed on GitHub under names like Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, and then the name of whatever library it is. These tend to be uh, either driver libraries that help you interface with some particular piece of hardware uh, or helper libraries that allow you to work on a project at a bit of a higher level without worrying about as many of the um, more complex details. Uh, across all those libraries this week, we had a relatively light week, just three pull requests merged this week uh, from two authors. Uh, so thanks to Justin and Jeff this week. And the uh, those three pull requests had three reviewers, uh, Jeff, Scott, and myself. And the oldest one was uh, only 13 days this week. The newest one was one day. That leaves us with 53 open pull requests. The oldest one of those is a draft at 697 days. Newest one is uh, actually two days this week. We had two issues that were closed by two people with three new issues opened up by two people. And that leaves us at the end of the week with 865 uh, open issues. And there are 103 of those that are labeled uh, good first issue, which you would be able to find uh, over at circuitpython.org contributing, which is where you should head if you are interested in getting involved 
in the CircuitPython project um, in terms of either contributing or reviewing contributions to the code. On that page, you're gonna find a list of open PRs and open issues. Uh, you can click a couple of navigation links at the top to go back and forth between issues and PRs. A uh, good first place to go if you're just getting started is to take a look at the list of open PRs, find something in there that is either interesting to you or that you've got the hardware for. You can go ahead and click through to GitHub, uh, take a look at the code changes in that PR, um, look it over for spelling, uh, syntax, um, logic, all of that sort of stuff. And if you do have the hardware, go ahead and give it a try on that device and then leave a comment on GitHub letting us know what you found when you looked over the code and if you tried it out. Um, if you do that a couple of times, get comfortable with the process, we can get you leveled up to leave uh, official reviews on GitHub. Um, if you wanna actually start getting your hands dirty with some code, you can also click on over to the issues and again, find something in that list of issues, either that is of particular interest to you or that you've got hardware for that you know you can test. Um, click through again to GitHub, uh, take a look at the issue, whether it's a bug fix or a new feature or whatever, and uh, take a crack at actually implementing that and submit your own uh, PR. Uh, we do have guides for contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub. So if you uh, need help with that, we can point you into the uh, the learn guide for those resources. We also have folks uh, who are around throughout the week on Discord who are going to be more than willing to help folks uh, get involved in contributing or reviewing. So if you uh, want to do that, but you feel there is some barrier in terms of the technologies uh, or anything like that, please come and say hi, ask us on the Discord. Uh, we're definitely going to be more than happy to help get you spun up. Um, in terms of the library uh, PyPI weekly download stats, we had over the past week uh, 138,249 uh, downloads across 330 libraries. The top 10 list is here if you're interested in that, and the updated library this week was requests. And that's what we've got for libraries. Thanks. Hello, um, so Blinkit is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. This week we had four pull requests merged by three authors and one reviewer. There are currently three open pull requests amongst other repositories. Uh, there was one closed issue by one person and one open by one person, uh, leaving a net of 100 open issues. We are at 16,324 PyPI downloads in the last week. We are at 18,507 PyWheels downloads in the last month, and uh, we are currently at 133 boards. And that's it. Thank you, Melissa. That rounds out the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka, and brings us to Hug Reports. I'm going to go down this list in turn, read any that are uh, marked as uh, missing the meeting or uh, otherwise for me to read. Uh, but I'll start with myself, and I just have a group hug this week. Next up is Dan, and then we'll go to Tim. Hello, Dan. Are, are you ready with your hug reports, or shall I read them out? Uh, I'm okay. There's, it, I stopped hearing you at all, so I restarted Discord, and it forced me to download a new version. <laughs> I did all that in 30 seconds. Um, thanks to Retired Wizard for testing things and reporting problems and various clear issues, looking at a whole bunch of things and maybe looking into some fixes as well. So thanks very much to you. That's it. All right. Uh, next up is Tim and then Liz. All right. Uh, hug reports for me this week. Thanks um, to you, Jeff, for looking into uh, some issues surrounding PyLint and different versions uh, and their compatibility with Python 3.12 and sharing some uh, results of which versions behave under which versions of Python and stuff like that. Uh, on, a, on a similar note, thanks to Dan and Maker Melissa, uh, who both investigated a, uh, similar stuff and left breadcrumbs in uh, GitHub issue comments, which ultimately led me to uh, the solution pretty quickly this morning. And then uh, lastly for me, thanks to Justin for working on a base64 uh, stream library, which I think is a super neat utility. Thanks. Next is Liz and then maker Melissa. Hey, so hug report to Dan for coming by show and tell to discuss the newest circuit Python release and a group hug. Thank you. And Melissa? I want to give a hug to Dan for 
your continued assistance with the Circuit Python code editor and uh, group hug to everyone else. And rounding out the section, it is Scott, also known as Tan Newt. Hello. Um, first, a hug to Rai uh, on Discord for l getting excited for my deep dive on Friday and looking into thread support. Um, and also checking with us about approach in the channel before going too far down that rabbit hole. And then also a hug to you, Jepler, for looking into IPv6 support in CircuitPython. I know it's kind of brain melting. I hope your brain's okay. Uh, my brain is muddling along. Thanks for asking. Um, that rounds out hug reports, so we will do status updates next. Uh, mechanically, this works just like hug reports, but this time we'd like to hear uh, what you've been up to in the CircuitPython world since the last time we had a chance to chat, and then what you hope to get up to in the next week or so. I will start, and then we'll go down the list, continuing with Dan. So last week I did some smaller miscellaneous stuff, including a small improvement to Adafruit PIO ASM error reporting. And as uh, Scott alluded to, I started on IPv6 support. Um, this week I'm still trying to get anything to work. It appears that the board is not allocating itself an IPv6 address. Um, I see that other computers on my network have IPv6 addresses, although those are not internet connected addresses. Um, and I'm kind of printing ESP IDF low level debugging things and using packet dumpers and, and all that fun stuff to try and understand what's going on. And another thing I wanted to let everybody know about is I will be out for a few weeks starting July 29th. So I've got uh, two weeks before I'm taking a little vacation. And that wraps it up for me. Next, uh, it's time for Dan. And after that, we'll hear from Foamy Guy. All right. Um, so as mentioned, I released CircuitPython 910 final uh, last week, I guess last Wednesday or so. And uh, please try it out. Uh, usually, often people wait until uh, the actual final release to try things. Uh, fortunately, we don't seem to have too many um, showstoppers or anything. But we will be making some fixes to 9.1. Um, and then I started merging uh, upstream, that is for MicroPython. They've released version 122 and 123 since we last merged. And I, on Friday, I merged, uh, started merging v122, and I've resolved most of the merge conflicts. And then I will go back and look at the, all the files that have changed, because sometimes even the auto-merge files have changes that I need to do something about. Um, fortunately, this merge looks a little smaller than some of the previous ones that we were doing. Um, so that's it. Thank you, Dan. Uh, next, we have Tim, followed by Liz. All right. Uh, in the past week or so, I have been uh, mostly trying to get set back up. I had a hard drive uh, fail on me last Monday, so I've been in the process of getting all my apps and tools set back up, and um, I went ahead and took the opportunity to update to Ubuntu 24.04, so I've also been uh, kind of slowly revealing uh, different tools and modules that, um, aside from just needing to be reinstalled, need to be updated to newer versions than what I was using before and working through some of the problems that comes uh, come from that, but uh, I think we're getting pretty close and starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel uh, as far as that goes. So. Um, getting there slowly but surely. Uh, and then I'll just uh, say, uh, as a reminder to everyone, uh, back up uh, any important files that you may have that um, you care about. Because uh, there were a few things that I lost that I wish I didn't, uh, but luckily nothing super critical. Uh, but let, let this be the warning to go and uh, get your backups updated. Um, the other stuff I've been up to, I finished the utility that I started last week uh, for rotating bitmaps using a couple of shear operations. Um, currently, this is implemented as a function, but I'm hoping to refactor it into a class uh, and maybe try to find a home for it, although I don't know um, if there is a great candidate of an existing library that it would make sense in. Um, and in the long term, I may also uh, try to go into the core and bitmap tools and make a C implementation of it as well. Uh, but for right now, it's Python only. Um, I've been doing some library reviews this morning, uh, mostly around infrastructure related things, versions of PyLint and other pre-commit uh, small fixes and stuff. Uh, 
just a bit before the, the meeting, I actually ran into this, that Circup uh, doesn't seem to be compatible with Python 3.12. There's something we use in there that was removed. Uh, so I'm planning to go dig into that a bit this afternoon and see if I can get that updated um, to work on Python 3.12. And then the last thing, uh, which I have a note to talk about a bit more down in the weeds as well, is related to updating the Python, uh, excuse me, updating the PyLint version for our libraries um, or potentially changing over to Ref, which we discussed um, a bit back as well. But we'll talk about that a bit more uh, later on. That's what I have. Thanks. Thank you, Tim. Uh, next up, we'll hear from Liz and after that, maker Melissa. Hey, so last week I worked on a circuit Python library for the HDC 3021 temperature and humidity sensor. It's a high precision I squared C sensor. It has some cool features like setting auto measurements and high low alert thresholds. I think that could be useful for some projects. Um, I started working on an ESP32 S3 Bluetooth macro pad project in CircuitPython. This is a collab with the Rose Brothers and it uses one of the chunky CNC rotary encoders. And then in uh, personal electronic projects over the weekend, I took out the guts of an S4000 television video game console with the goal to use the housing switches and slide pots with some I squared C breakouts, basically making it a giant STEMA console. Uh, I wired up the components with GPIO expander and an ADS 7830ADC, and a couple of switches aren't currently working, so I'll need to investigate a little further, but hopefully I can bring uh, some progress by show and tell on Wednesday. And that's what we've got going on. That sounds like a fun project. Uh, next, we'll hear from maker Melissa and round out the section after that with Scott. Hello, um, so I fixed the reliability of the CircuitPython code editor with USB workflow. Uh, I figured out that it needed to be rewritten with raw mode rather than raw paste mode, so I spent a couple days rewriting it to exclusively use raw mode from the connection point onwards, keeping in mind to have much better mode awareness. So now it is reliably connecting and returning results, and I am currently working on testing with MicroPython. And while it does connect, I test it with an older version. Many of the file operations are CircuitPython specific, so they need to be reworked a bit. And that's where I'm at. All right, thank you. And last we have Scott. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm in the weeds uh, working on Matter support. Um, you can now find it at github.com slash adafruit slash circuit matter. Um, I'm actually getting the CI set up right now, so doing rough and PyTest. Um, and I'm working on the TLV packet encoding and decoding. And I'm adding tests while I do that because the spec has some examples that are perfect for unit tests. So I'm TLV encoding, and then after that, there'll be higher level protocol stuff. All right, Scott has disclosed he's in the weeds, but the rest of us are going to join him there for the last section of the meeting called In the Weeds. And uh, we've got one topic that is from Tim, so I will hand it off to you. All right, thank you. Um, this is centered around the, the CircuitPython libraries, and in particular, the version of PyLint that we have pinned in our pre-commit uh, config. It turns out that that version of PyLint um, doesn't, it's unable to be installed, at least by default, with Python 3.12. Um, so there's a couple of like potential fixes um, for that. I guess uh, one is just we're not ready to update to Python 3.12 yet and use a lower version. So that's always one option is just keep things how they are. Um, and I can downgrade um, and the whatever version is declared inside of the actions tasks um, will work inside of the in, in the GitHub infrastructure, obviously. So we can keep it set there to whatever we want. In terms of actually fixing it right now, though, if we do want to go um, that route of making a change to fix it, the the two things that come to mind to me are like obviously we can just update PyLint to a newer uh, version. Um, there's been a bit of testing. Uh, thanks to Jeff. Thank you for uh, reporting that uh, version two dot. 8.3 of PyLint works. And then um, there's also been testing on some of the newer ones. I know 3.1 was, uh, 3.1.0 was mentioned in one of these comments that's linked here in the doc. Um, and that is one that I tested as well uh, and is working. So um, quick and easy fix would be to just update that PyLint to, to a newer one, either 2.8.3, or we could go up to a 3.x branch, or uh, even the brand newest one that's out now is 3.25. I don't know if we would want to jump um, all the way to something just released within the past month or so, but that is one option as well. Um, 
or uh, alternatively, instead of going through all the libraries now or using Adabot or something to update the version of PyLint, something we discussed um, a couple of months back, I think at this point, was uh, moving the libraries over to Ruff, um, which would effectively, if I, if I understand it correctly, that would effectively be like an alternative to um, not only just PyLint, but also to Black. Um, and I think you get a couple of other things like iSort, which is something we don't use on all the libraries, but we do have uh, on some of them at this point. So um, if we were to move to Ruff, then obviously the version of PyLint won't matter anymore, um, but it will come with some more you know, substantial changes at the time that we pull the trigger on it, so to speak, right? So if we do make that change, not only do we need to update the config file, but we would also need to um, go and make whatever changes that Ruff, you know, flags as a failure. Uh, or if we don't do that, then the the main branch of the repos will be in a uh, an actions fail state. Um, so they won't release and do all of that stuff properly. Um, Personally, I think I kind of lean towards the rough option. I know we discussed more the specific pros and cons and the, the specific utilities and stuff that rough has. We discussed that back when this came up the first time. So I don't necessarily um, know that we need to rehash all of it. Although if, uh, if anyone would like to, we can um, speak more about it now. But I think the, the direction of Heading towards rough makes sense to me because it seems a little bit simpler in terms of being able to lose, uh, you know, two or three of those um, different dependencies and get them all under one umbrella. Just sounds compelling, um, appealing, I should say, from the maintenance perspective um, to me. But it, you know, the, the the counter to that argument is just the extra amount of stuff that we'll need to change right away. So um, I think what I'm looking for mostly is does Anyone have thoughts or opinions on the short term of like either updating to, to a newer pilot as a minor change um, or going ahead and making the leap now to move over to Ruff? Um, and then if we do want to do the latter, um, try to move over to Ruff, does anyone have thoughts or ideas or opinions on uh, kind of the mechanics of the rollout? I know we have a couple of um, PRs that are out there, thanks to Justin, who uh, put these in back when we talked about it the first time. So there are some examples out there that illustrate, you know, essentially the exact changes that would need to be done in the in the config files, as well as the types of things um, that will get changed as far as like syntax and import order and, and other stuff like that. Um, so we've got some that we could uh, that we could look at. But yeah, I think that's the main things that I'm wondering is but he's got thoughts or ideas on that stuff. Yeah, I feel like we previously decided in principle we wanted to switch to rough, uh, but what didn't happen was Adafruit didn't say to anybody in particular, hey, go and spend 10 hours or, you know, X hours on this. And I think, um, you know, that's not entirely a conversation for, for here because this is about who is, is Adafruit allocating to work on this because it will be a lot of work all put together. Uh, but I would love it if we could switch to rough. A thing that I became aware of in adapting in adopting rough in a personal project is the default range of diagnostics that it shows is a lot smaller than pilot. And so I mentioned this, um, at least in the chat today, we would need to figure out which ones to turn on. You can, you know, turn them on and off um, one at a time, just like pilot. But the default set is is pretty small and doesn't have all the same checks. Nothing will have exactly the same checks, but it checked many fewer things. Like um, I think it was not opinionated about function names, for instance. Um, but uh, I, I would love if we could go to rough, but it's just, you know, somebody needs to, to say, can I get my time allocated to do this? Um, and then And then do it. I think the other thing to think about is upstream, which maybe Dan's going to address. Well, you go ahead. Yeah, no, MicroPython uses rough. In or, what version? Uh, as pretty recently, maybe already, I think. Like maybe even as a 121 or not. Uh, we have our own code formatting, so we ignore. It doesn't interfere with the merge. Um, But it, 
I think in terms of the libraries, uh, Tim, isn't it true that, I mean, you could do, the libraries could be done on a piecemeal basis, right? Because each library stands alone. Um, or you have to make some change in, in, in the shared stuff. Um, so the, the pre-commit config file would change. I would say the libraries can be done. Um, they can be done piecemeal. The one kind of caveat that I, that I would mention that comes with it is basically if the library, so, so what it boils down to is essentially if the, if the libraries diverge from each other, um, then the tool within Adabot that allows them to be updated automatically is less effective, basically. So the, the further apart that those common files get, the less effective that that tool is. So the risk, um, so to speak, with doing the piecemeal is whatever that time period from when the first one is done until the last one is done, during that window, we would basically, it, it would just be harder to do any kind of other mass updates during that window, uh, which may not matter. If nothing else comes up, then it really is not a downside. Um, but if we start that and we get half of them done and then some other thing pops up where we say, oh, we need to go and run um, some other patch, then it gets a little bit hairier, I think. You can always make the patcher be smart and look at whether it's a new, a rough or a non rough Yeah, that's true. And there are other ways that that utility that is within Adabot is also not the only way to achieve automation either. That's just one of the ways out there. There are a couple other couple other ways to achieve that stuff, depending on what the actual changes needed are. So yeah, maybe that's not a um, not a big enough downside to really be a concern. So, like, so I, I guess the process is. I mean, any particular to update any particular library, you you update its pre-commit and the CI to use it, and then you see whether it fails, right? So, yep. and and so the question is, like, how often does that failure occur? How much cleanup is there to do? Um, and also, you yeah. have to make this decision about, well, what should I? What what kind of check should I really enable? And it would be nice not to have to. Is that that check stuff? Is that in a central place, like the the, the like the rough in this the rough configuration configuration file? Is does it have to be copied everywhere, or are we getting that from um, Circuit Python build tool or something, some other shared repo? In the yeah. project that I used it in, those settings were coming from uh, pyproject.toml which is unfortunately a file that has different content for every uh, project. I think you could also, for instance, give it um, within the pre-commit uh, YAML file because you can just specify them as command line arguments, which uh, checks to include and which checks to exclude. So what, like, and we right might now want to we do it in that way. RC, or we have the equivalent of a pilot RC, and where is that? Where are those? That's okay, inside we're... of pyproject.toml. They they have the idea generally in the Python tooling world of we want to put all the settings within one toml file so that they come together, which is kind of contrary to what we might want, which is, oh, wouldn't it be great if we could refer to it somewhere else? Um, I Does can look into whether there's... Mechanism? Okay. I can Go look ahead, into whether yeah. there's something else. That's all I know about. And does Rough have any, have any mechanism for indirect referring to some files elsewhere yeah i didn't see that capability but i did not go yeah. looking for it okay um so tim how did it come up that we got into this problem were you just trying to update a library and um i mean well for me so because i just updated to ubuntu 2404 it came with python 312 so i have been so prior to this week, I was not using Python 3.12. And then basically this morning, as I was trying to do library PRs, I went to run pre-commit on something and it failed. And then I started kind of pulling at the thread, which led me back through some of the posts that you and Maker Melissa made um, about updating PyLint, which then I just remembered that we had this discussion about potentially changing over to Rough. So it seemed like yeah. it would make sense to at least consider um, 
at least consider and talk about the changeover if we were in any way considering going and updating pylon. Yeah, when this happened to me, all I did was just for the library I was working on, I updated it. Right. Yep. And that's I have done that locally on the one that I was working on. Um, I didn't I didn't uh, commit that change or anything, but yeah, I did that locally just to get past it. But it would be, I mean, I could say at, at least personally for my workflow, it'd be really convenient to not have to necessarily right. make that change in my local copies. So I, I think so doing that and then at the same time, like to do a mass patch like that, uh, and also then you would update the the runner Ubuntu version that's specified in the YAML files, some in whatever YAML file there is, uh, to say the CI to say, well, use Ubuntu latest or use Ubuntu 2404 instead of Right now, it's pinned to 2204, probably, or something. Uh, it it's the be. action setup Python that's pinned at 3.11. OK. So both of those things would change. So you could make such a mass commit change. Um, well, I guess the question is whether, obviously, that would be less work than, than roughing everything. OK. Right. Um, but ultimately, it sounds like we want to end up in the rough world. So. Yeah, so maybe just go ahead. I mean, that was Justin's intention was let's try let's try some guinea pig libraries and see how much work it is. And I didn't really look at like how much work was it. <laughs> and but I think to do several and then figure out at one point like okay, so what are the changes we can make automatically, and then do those is. But I think it's it is a question to ask management, so to speak, about 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 spending time on this. But it has to be done eventually. So to just make a list, and you know, we could each also take a few of these and do them, um, as opposed to trying to do it in a big bang. Like you could do twenty at a time or something. Like once you automate it, right? Yeah, and I think especially once you start getting into it and start seeing what the changes are uh, in any of them that don't get done automatically, I think we'll start to get, start to pick up on and become relatively quick. Right, exactly. So I think, I think if you just sort of proceed from that point and do some of them and do the ones that as you update libraries, which ones you need to do, that's fine because it, it, as we say, it doesn't, you, you know, the disadvantage you pointed out is that if we had to do them, a mass change, then it might be a problem. But this is a mass change, so <laughs> it's one of the mass changes we want to do. So uh, I think that's fine to go ahead with that. So okay, and then I would say I would say, I would say there's I don't I see it no reason to hold back from converting libraries to rough. Okay, I also don't see a strong reason to feel feel that you have to do okay. them all. Like all at once. Go and do them all at once. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. In that case, I think uh, if it if it sounds good to everybody, I will. Uh, I'm in a similar boat to you. I I took a look through these PRs back when they came in, but I can't say that I necessarily took a super close look through them. So, um, I will plan on kind of starting with these ones that are open, uh, reviewing those, merging them if there's nothing. Uh, too crazy or anything that shakes out. Um, they are a bit old, so there might be conflicts and stuff that need to be worked through at this point. But um, I'll go through those and just kind of we can start with those ones. And then from there, I will just do them as I am looking at reviews for existing PRs and stuff, if that sounds if that sounds good. OK. Is it, and Scott, does that sound OK to you, too? Yeah, that's fine. OK. So um, I just dropped in the text chat the just mobilize uh, rough config that Tim linked to selects three categories I, PL, and UP and ignores two specific warnings within those categories. And the project where I made the most use of rough, I used, I don't know how it renders on your screen, but three lines worth of categories that I selected and then uh, four that I disabled or ignored. So um, 
there's just a huge range of functionality that you can choose to enable or to leave disabled in rough and it would be good if we can make the right decision about this at first especially since in in both of these projects the place that these settings are going is in pyproject.toml which will not be a adabot a, which is not a great file to patch with adabot because so much of the content um, is specific to that project and so i'm not sure if a patch will apply automatically so has somebody in the rough world i mean we're not the only people with this problem so yeah I'm is thinking... there a way to translate my pi lint settings to rough i i don't know that would be a really good idea to look for right 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 I, i'm thinking that somebody has already done this so we should that's something to explore tim is to say like I want to convert to rough and I want it to be as strict as pilot initially. What are the flags that I need? And then some of them we can get rid of. Like the, the thing about like three letter variable names at least and stuff, that, that's been really annoying and we could get rid of that. Ooh, neat. Yeah, it looks like there is. I have a. Uh, oh, yeah, there is. Right there. Oh, Jeff just found it. Yeah. The other thing that we could consider is extending Adabot to just parse the file and change it instead of trying to use a patch. Like it's yeah. parse the toml, add something to it and spit it back out should be doable, I think. Yeah, definitely doable, just as a, a different um, action basically than what's what's built in there. So yeah, we could totally add add one or add functionality that's more easily able to modify those files that differ. Um, is there, and I, I'll search around for this as well, but in case if anyone happens to know it, um, is there like a quick, easy place to find the listing of what all those do? Because one thing that strikes me is this big list of three lines of select things. Yeah, uh, a few of them have sort of recognizable names, but a lot of them are don't mean anything to me necessarily. Um, yeah, I, I, I know there's an issue about using the nicer names that Pilot has, but I don't think it's been closed. Thank you. So when you do this, you might format them, force them to be a single line or something. Okay, cool. I will look through this list as well and compare what's here to in the PRs, and then uh, leave any. I'll, I'll just leave any comments I find in the in one of the PRs, and I would say the same uh, same for anybody else who's interested. Is if you want to take a look at the three or four that are there, and if there's ones that we want to that you think would be good to have in addition to them, uh, just leave a comment on one of those open PRs. Okay. All right. Well, I, I appreciate that discussion and it would be really nice to actually do this. So uh, thanks for, for the work that you're about to do, Tim. And if that's it for that topic, that was the only in the weeds topic. So we can wrap up this meeting. Uh, thank you all for joining us for the July 15th, 2024 CircuitPython weekly meeting. This week meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord. Join at any time by going to adafru.it slash discord. To support the folks who uh, are compensated by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython, consider buying your electronics from adafruit.com. And the next meeting will be next Monday, July 22nd, 2024, at the usual date and time. Thanks to everybody who participated.